Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to thank everyone who has taken the time to rate and review the podcast on whatever podcast app they're using. This week, multiple people on Twitter told me that they found the podcast because of some sort of like trending chart thing, which means your ratings and reviews are actually helping people find Potterless, which is great, and I cannot thank you guys enough. Speaking of thanks, thanks to our newest Patreon supporters, Kelsey Williams and Aurora Fruhoff. Aurora, my five-month-old niece, has enough of an allowance from my sister Megan to be a supporter of the podcast. So thank you, Aurora. I really do appreciate it. Thank you also for being so cute and for everyone telling me congratulations on being an uncle, even though I literally did nothing. But I get congratulated all the time. It's fantastic. And as always, huge shout out to our producer level patrons, Leanne Davis, Griffin Meckelberg, Vicky Garcia, Andreas Uzelby, and Aaron Johnson, who always make paper basketball shots into garbage cans when they yell Kobe. So without further ado, let's get into episode 17 of Potterless, starring Rosiana Hulse Rojas, a great episode that is very long, so I'm gonna keep this intro short, but there's lots of great talk and tangents that we went on. It's amazing. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as I do. Internet, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a 24-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. I'm very honored today to be joined by a very special guest, uh, the Internet's own Rosiana Halsey Rojas. Did I butcher that pronunciation? I think it was very close. It's Hulse, but Hulse, you know, also okay. no one really knows how to pronounce that, so it's all good. I didn't know with the Rojas if it was like just Hulse or if there was like a, a little accent y on the oh, end. No. Oh no. Yeah, just very British. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm so excited. But no, I'm I'm very happy to have you on to talk about some Goblet Thanks of for Fire stuff. Me. No problem. This is actually a really meaty section of the yeah, book. Yeah, so much goes on in, in so few chapters. There's so much packed in. I was very pleasantly surprised at how much. It's great. It's great. Great great few chapters. I've heard that in five you have like very angsty Harry, mm -hmm. and I feel like these sections of the book is like the beginning of angsty Harry because he's got the argument with Ron and the whole dance thing and I'm we're starting to get into like annoying teenager Harry and I'm really excited about it well also not not just Harry uh, Ron and Hermione as well like they have their moments so yeah you can really tell that the hormones have kicked in at this point <laughs> yeah, I wonder like, if it happens with all of them yeah I wonder if, if while I was a teenager like if I was their age when I was reading this, if I would have sympathized with them for yeah. everything. Because, like, reading this, I'm like, oh, my God, you guys are being so immature. This is terrible. Well, because I, I remember with, not to skip ahead too much, but sure. I remember with Five, uh, when I read it for the first time, I was like, well, I don't know why everyone's so angry at Harry for this, because I feel exactly the same. <laughs> so, for me, I was pretty much the same age uh -huh. as Harry was in those books, and I always felt quite defensive of him, because <laughs> I would also be, like, a complete stroppy cow, but so great. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Let's get right into it. We'll do chapter 17, The Four Champions. Yes. At this point, you basically have Harry being extremely stunned the fact that he's been called up to be in the tournament. In addition to him being stunned, you have Dumbledore being very upset. Yeah, he's kind of got that like silent power yeah. situation where it's kind of like, I'm, I'm not angry at you, I'm disappointed. Oh, ex that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's the classic dad line. But the funniest thing about it, Tumblr had pointed this out. But in the book, it says, like, did you put your name in the goblet? Dumbledore whispered. Yeah. And then there's, in the movie, he, like, picks him up and, like, shakes him and, like, verbally yeah, he's, like, assaults him. like, trying to, like, shake something out of his body or something. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. It's so good. I just love how different that is. Anyway, they go into the back room. Hugo Bagman is there. And he explains to the other champions what happened and the fact that Harry has to compete. Because rather than follow the rules of the tournament, it's like, well, the goblet is the all-being deity that we must obey. Yeah, they say binding magical contract, but one thing that I've always been curious about is what happens when you break a binding magical contract and also like what are the conditions of breaking and binding magical contract is it like just showing up like not showing up what are the terms of this contract <laughs> you gotta read your contracts i feel like worst case scenario is the goblet gets mad at you but it's also a goblet but it is a goblet of fire like, that is true it could burn it's, everything it could burn you. <laughs> like is it cursed fire who knows <laughs> And also, why doesn't the contract say there should only be one person from each school in it? Right. Like, why doesn't the contract say that? It's just like, everyone's got to be in, even if some crazy stuff happens. Yeah. 
Yeah. All of the all of the schoolmasters come in, plus Snape and McGonagall, which my favorite thing running through the book is that they always bring in Snape and McGonagall for stuff, but never the Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff person. Ever. No. Well, <laughs> I mean, they're not, they're like... Professor Sprout, she's got her own stuff. She's probably, like, gone back to her greenhouses. Uh-huh. Flitwick is just, you know, he's so short. He might even be in the room and they don't know. <laughs> I, I also had no idea it was Sprout and Flitwick. I don't know if they've never said that or if I just totally missed it. I think they, had, I think they said it in the, in the first one, but they don't, they don't point to it that often. They okay, do it might be super point brief. To it in, uh, I, think, I can't remember if it, I think it's either this chapter or, or the next one uh, when they talk about Harry being cold-shouldered. And how, like, <laughs> even Professor Sprout slightly cold yeah, him. Yeah, you're right, you're There's, right. There's, like, something about that. Yeah. Okay. So Fleur, who we will see this throughout the rest of the book, is super upset about this, but about everything in general. <laughs> so she gets really upset and says, like, why are they letting this, quote, little boy compete? So Harry is, like, not mad at this situation, but he does get mad at Fleur calling him a little boy, yeah. which I think is great. He's like, I'm 14 years old. <laughs> yeah, he, like, he agrees with everyone. He's like, I also think this is stupid. Like, I shouldn't be able to compete. And then Fleur calls him a little boy. And he's like, how dare you? Yeah. Like, I'm a little man. <laughs> yeah. So he's really upset at that for some reason. The other two schools are very understandably upset because now there's two Hogwarts people in. Yeah. So they're doubling their chances of winning. And it's at this point when the uh, did you put your name in the goblet, he asked calmly happens, but in the movie he does not. Not so calmly. Harry says no. Everybody's like drilling him questions about how he got his name in there. Like, did you get around the age line? Yeah. Did you do all this other stuff? He's like, he's like, no, I didn't do anything. I promise. And all the masters then turn to Crouch and Bagman. And they're saying, you know, what should we do, guys? And Crouch is super creepy about the whole thing. Yeah. Really suspect. So I 100 per think. Uh, well, I 100% think. I like 100 per think better though. 100 per think. I, that's a, it's just a shorthand version of 100 per <laughs> think. I totally think that Crouch did it. I'm putting all of my eggs into the Crouch is the one that put the name in basket. Because of his like dramatic fireplace standing moment. Yeah, the, yeah. Like he's like leaning against it and, and she's like, and he looked like a skull or something like that. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's totally guilty, like 100%. Especially because they try so hard to make it look like Krakarov did it. And if J.K. Rowling has taught me anything, it's that she loves red herrings. So there's no way that Krakarov did it. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's kind of like the classic villain i feel like he's like the bond he's like a bond villain sure except he also just seems kind of rubbish like he's like a, <laughs> he's like a bond villain who became a headmaster he went into administration or yeah. bureaucracy or something so he's, he's kind of like been dampened a little bit by life. <laughs> like he wanted to be more evil than his job allows him to be yeah yeah and he's trying to like live again through crumb but it's not really uh, working oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so moody comes in and Moody is a total bro, defends Harry, saying that someone probably put Harry's name in because they want to kill Harry since so many people have died during this tournament before. So Moody's theory is that there's a powerful wizard using a confundus charm on the goblet mm-hmm. that tricked the goblet into thinking that there is a fourth school entering the tournament and then put Harry's name in as a member of that fourth school so that he would have a 100% chance of getting picked. So that is... Moody's theory. This part is interesting to me because I think it's the first time in the books. I might be wrong about this, and I'm sure, like, if I am, someone will correct me. But I think mm-hmm. it's the first time in the books that we hear that confunders charms can be put on objects rather than just people. Yes, I think so. But Beca- or like whether that's a question of do, is the goblet of fire, and then maybe also things like the sorting hat. Do they behave more like people? And where is like the line between object and person in the wizarding world? When it comes Ooh. to like spells and stuff, that's something that's, that I've been thinking about a lot. Like how, yeah, that's super fun. What, what, what makes it possible to to perform a confundus charm on a massive goblet? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a it's an all knowing goblet with a special contract we must obey. So apparently, yeah. you can confund it. Maybe it's just like if it's a really important object, you can confund yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> or if it has like if it has like rules, if it's like a computer and it has rules programmed into it then you can confront yeah. it. Maybe humans are like that too. I feel like if I was in 
Gryffindor or whatever, I would use a Confundus charm on the fat lady painting so that I could just walk yeah. in and not have to remember a password. Like, I would just confund it yeah. to be like, I would just say open, and then it would. And then just out of laziness. If you were, like, serious or someone and trying to, like, break in in Prisoner of Azkaban, like, that seems True. like a much easier way than getting a cat Wait, to yeah. steal the passwords for you. Oh, you could just confund us the Whomping Willow so it stops murdering people. Yeah. And doesn't, like, punch everything. <laughs> I don't know, though. I think that thing's pretty determined. That thing is... Moody starts to hint at uh, Karkarov having a past of being a dark wizard, but while he's doing that, Dumbledore interrupts him and then reveals that Mad-Eye Moody's real name is actually Alastor, and Harry has a great moment where he's like, oh yeah, I guess his name isn't Mad-Eye. Yeah, it's still one of my favorite <laughs> moments throughout the series. He's like, who is he talking about? Oh, wait. <laughs> so apparently Crouch is looking very sick also, which I think just continually adds to the his guiltiness like <laughs> clearly his exposure to Voldemort is making him sick or something so Crouch and Bagman then explain the rules that you're not allowed to have any help in the tournament for any of the challengers which gets violated profusely <laughs> um, you learn that the the next test happened you learn what the next test is after the previous one ends if you are one of the champions, you don't have to take final exams, which is like, why didn't the whole school enter? Like, right. are you kidding but me? Like, I wonder, did they, did they just not tell them this beforehand? Also, how does that work? If you're 17 years old and you're taking the most important exams of your life, mm -hmm. um, which determine your job <laughs> prospects, is the assumption that like just because you were picked for the Goblet of Fire, that shows your skills way better than these grueling exams that people have been working their, you know, whole seven years of Hogwarts for. That's yeah. always been the one that I've been like, <laughs> or when they say, I think it's the end of Chamber of Secrets, and they're like, exams are cancelled. I'm like, I like the idea, but in practice, <laughs> this, this is terrible. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, especially when you have the case like Harry, who's very bad at school, yeah. but is really good at saving the world and being a wizard. I don't know. It would be like a great loophole for him because he wouldn't have to take the tests because he's dumb. But you're right. Like, it would be like if you were applying for college or something and you had some special thing. It was like, oh, he didn't have to take the SATs. He was in a very important basketball tournament or something. Yeah, it's, it's, They're like, oh, okay. Clearly he's fit for this college because he was in this. But they, but they do say from the outset that, like, the Triwizard Tournament is very famous and is covered, you know, widely and so on. Which is just interesting because yeah. it, like, hints to how weird it must be coming from, like, a muggle-born household into this world where all of these, like, things have huge <laughs> value to people. And yet yeah. you're like, what? What is this? Why are people so excited about it? Yeah. Yeah, at, at 10 years old, you learn everything that's important. And then, like, in maybe four yeah. years, you'll be competing in the most important thing ever that you didn't know happened four years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. Very interesting stuff. So everyone leaves, and Harry notes that Cedric goes down a strange set of stairs instead of the normal marble staircase, which we learn later becomes the kitchen. Yeah. Harry, and I also think this, thinks that Voldemort is somehow behind this. Harry has my approach to every time something weird happens, is he's like, he's just like, I don't know what's going on, but I bet Voldemort's involved. And that is always what I'm thinking when I'm reading <laughs> the books. <laughs> I mean, it's got a pretty good uh, ratio coming true. Yeah, even, even in the second book when it was like a snake slash Voldemort from the past, it was still Voldemort. Like, it's always a good guess. It's still Voldemort. It'd always be like, you know what? Voldemort's doing something. Yeah. So Harry goes to the room. He goes back to the Gryffindor dorm. And to his surprise, everyone at Gryffindor is actually really happy for him. And they throw him like a little congratulations party, which is awesome. Harry is enjoying the party, but then he leaves the party to go to sleep because he's a loser. He's very stressed. Yeah. Ron <laughs> <laughs> so he finds Ron, who's being so sassy about it. Oh, Ron man. is basically super mad that Harry got picked. He's the worst in this. It makes <laughs> us, oh, poor, poor Harry is just like, well... At least Hermione and Ron will believe me. And then he goes up to his room and Ron's like, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hate you. So he doesn't believe yeah. Harry when he tells him that he put his name in the goblet. And Ron, you basically learn yeah. later, is just super jealous. And that's the end of chapter 17. Yeah. So we get into chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands. So Harry wakes up to go to breakfast and the Gryffindor people are still hype. Like, they're still so excited. Like, it's the next morning and everyone's like, Harry! But they're the party animal house. You can totally tell, like, they, if they went to university, they'd be the people who you would hate to have as your neighbors, who'd be yeah. nonstop, like, at it. 
Um, mm-hmm. But who would also be really fun and you know, yeah. organize fun socials. Oh, as a fun little question, which which house are you in? Uh, what do Gryffindor. you identify? <laughs> Gryff- okay, me too. Awesome. Uh, I think you might be the first like full Gryffindor I've had on. I'm very yeah. excited. Life, lifelong Gryffindor. <laughs> Everyone's like, I'm a Hufflepuff. I'm really nice. And I'm like, eh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I took the quiz that combines all of the questions of the sorting hat um, on Pottermore. Uh-huh. It's like, I can't remember how many questions, it's like 42 questions or something. Whoa, and I got dang. 90, I got 92% Gryffindor and then 20% everything else. <laughs> Whereas like most other people I know got like 90 or 80% and then everything else is like 70% or 60%. I'm like, no. No. Oh, uh, that's yeah. fantastic. Oh, I'm all about this. This is great. This is going to be a fantastic episode. Yeah. So, so Hermione then grabs Harry with toast in yeah. hand and is like, we should go for a walk instead of eating breakfast. And Harry's like, good idea. Everyone in the school. That's that- friendship. <laughs> yeah, she is. Hermione proves to be like the greatest person in the series in the middle. She's like, just the best. She's the best person, the best friend, the best witch. Yeah. She also turns out to be the so best great. bully because she gets into a verbal altercation with Malfoy and destroys yeah. him. Like, she's good at yeah. literally everything. I don't understand what, how the whole series isn't about her. And yeah. I know well, that there's... it's really deep down. <laughs> When you think about it, I know there's the whole, like, f- fan theory of, like, Neville being the chosen one, which I'm really excited to learn about because I haven't... Yeah. I think it happens between four and five is, like, when this started. So I'm excited to see how it develops. But... I feel like there should be another theory about how Hermione is like clearly the greatest wizard that Hogwarts has to offer because she's yeah. a genius and is good at everything and is also really brave and funny and good at making fun of people. Like there's nothing she's bad at. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, sorry. I think I've got, uh, there are like carolers in my halls. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It'll make for a fun Christmas like, themed background. <laughs> I'm, I'm very confused as to what's happening outside. No, but it's so true. Like she, I, and I, I really like that this um, shows her anticipating like she is a little bit wiser than Harry in the sense of she mm-hmm. knows that everyone's going to be wanting a piece of him and yes. she's like hey how about we just go over here and extract ourselves from the situation and give him an opportunity to talk about how he's feeling and mm-hmm. he's just like she's just such a good friend what, yeah, what she really is she's fantastic so she's like yeah. you probably shouldn't eat breakfast in the cafeteria and Harry's like right 75 percent of the school plus Ron hates me Good call. (laughs) So they're walking around outside and he's like, I don't know why Ron is so mad at me. And Hermione's like, well, obviously he's jealous. And then Harry's like, what? No way. And then she has to like literally explain to him that he's super famous and gets all the attention and is good at Quidditch, which is Ron's favorite thing in the world and all this other stuff. And she's like, this just is the final straw. So he can't take it anymore. Like usually Ron is really good about this, but this is just too much. Yeah. Then Harry gets like really upset about this. He's like, oh, well, Ron's being dumb. And it's like, God, I know Ron is like annoying in this little argument, but I think Harry is way worse. You do? I do. Just because of how it ends, like yeah. it, later on in the chapters where he gets into the thing where he throws the pins at Ron, like that whole thing. Yeah. And the fact that Harry never apologizes for it. I thought Harry was way worse in the whole thing. You think it was Ron like, starts I off know, worse, but I, I kind think... of, I kind of get it. Like, I, I mean, I don't expect these boys to figure it out in this scene or in, in this part <laughs> of the book, but I get it because, like, he's like, you're jealous of this horrible, these horrible things I have over and over and over again. Yeah, that's true. Like Harry's like, I would love to be normal. I would love to not fear yeah. death every school you year. You can have. He doesn't want his fame. He wants a family, and uh, it's funny that the only thing Harry wants is what Ron has like Ron just yeah. Harry just wants like a good family situation and friends yeah. and Ron I think just <laughs> wants to be famous fame and money <laughs> which I also <laughs> get because he's seen the struggle of not having it and like certain things to him you know like Harry yeah. does, <laughs> Harry's like sure I'll buy the whole trolley full of sweets don't worry mm. about it like <laughs> Ron's never had that ability to make a casual decision in his life but yeah, then he true. has had a family, which, yeah. <laughs> so you know, as much, as much as the Dursleys are great characters, uh, uh, they've not the been a family. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Hermione then says you need to write to Sirius as well. And Harry actually agrees to that, which is smart. Yeah. But then there's a great moment where Hermione is talking about the Ron situation. She's like, you know what you have to do, right? And Harry goes, yeah, I got to give Ron a good kick to the... And then she interrupts and is like, no, right to Sirius. (laughs) It's so great. There were so many good instances of that throughout the books where she just like... J.K. Rowling's humor, it, it just, it rests on those moments of like, 
almost swearing or uh-huh. actually swearing yeah. but then like physical comedy coming into it as well mm-hmm. it's just great it's so yeah it's so cheeky it's good yeah I like the bit where um, Hedwig's really mad. <laughs> yes, that is soon. But before we get to that, there's one little note, and I'm very excited to talk to you about it because you're British. So Harry says, come off it, yeah. when she tells him that. And I feel like Harry, and this probably makes sense, but I feel like he's way more British with little phrases like that yeah. in the book than in the movie. I feel like in the movie, he never says things like, come off it, or bloody hell, or anything like yeah. that. And then he actually has a lot of them in the books, which makes sense because he's British. I just thought it was weird that the movie try to like almost Americanize him I think it's because the screenwriter is American okay yeah so I think that that I mean that was always something that I noticed throughout the films there were just little expressions that British kids um, especially in that time more so they do say more now but wouldn't say as much Um, Mm -hmm. just little like ways of phrasing stuff and it did always like get under my skin a little bit (laughs) yeah (laughs) no that's not I, 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 yeah. That's what I was thinking is I was like, if I was a, a British person watching the movies, I'd yeah. be so mad that he does. Like, I love little phrases like come off it. I think it's great. Yeah. Those are things I wish Americans said, but it was just a little thing I noticed. I don't think like for, for us, I, I think it's probably easier for you to pinpoint those specific phrases. But for me, it was just yeah. like the slight feeling of something being off. Just like noticing like a normal British human wouldn't say something like that. Yeah. 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 Mm, okay. <laughs> so now we get into Hedwig being really upset. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know if I'm going to make people mad about this, but I hate Hedwig. I think Hedwig you is- You hate a, Hedwig? She's so, is it a she or a he? I don't even know. She. Is it, she. It's she? Okay. She's so petty. Oh, she's like great. Like the most petty animal ever. She's great. <laughs> I don't, I think she, like, she's always just mad at Harry for the dumbest things. Harry's like, sorry, Hedwig. I have to, like, defeat Satan. Harry can be so rude to her. <laughs> She is like, I am your one friend, Harry. <laughs> I mean, I get that Hedwig had to live in a cage in the closet. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm like a huge fan of Hedwig because, I mean, she is petty, but she's also like, she's like, I'm here for a job and I'm not going to, I'm gonna do, when I do the job, I'm going to do it really well. But if That's I don't true. want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Or and if you don't want me to do it, then I'm going to be mad at you. I love that. <laughs> I respect true. that, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, a fun note is um, Amanda, who we've had on previous episodes, noted yeah. on tw- on Twitter that uh, that Hedwig is, like, in olden times was used as a colloquialism for a petty person. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. That's so funny. So it's one of the rare instances where J.K. Rowling's naming is actually good, because I've taken a stance against some of the names of characters, like how yeah. every found, well, every, how does every founder of the houses have an alliteration first and last name? Why not? You know, <laughs> who, doesn't? who doesn't? I think some names are really good, but then you have things like, what should we name the herbology teacher? Oh, I know professor sprout. Like, I love it. It's so great. Cause it could be a Brussels sprout or it could be a little sprout through the ground. There's so many facets to read it. Um, uh, no, I, uh, I, I, well, the other thing I really love about Hedwig is that that's like, you don't think of it in these terms sometimes, but uh, that's Harry's pet. And it's hard to think of her as a pet because she's also so like functional and useful. True. But that's his like companion. That's who he, um, that's his like biggest connection to the magical world while he's not in the magical world um, physically because yeah. she like is bringing cards and stuff, but also because. Mm-hmm. You know, most other people don't have a pet out. <laughs> so yeah. like, it's the one little thing that really marks him as a little bit different, even when he's at the Dursleys. So I True. think that's part of my fondness for this, okay. for this very petty owl. <laughs> I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. So he has, he's writing to Sirius, and he has to use a school owl because he used Hedwig last time. And if he keeps using the same owls over and over again, people will know where Sirius is hiding. Yeah. So Hedwig gets really mad, like claws him on the shoulder <laughs> while she flies away. Super sassy. So Harry then goes down back to the school after writing this letter. Yeah. And the rest of Hogwarts just hates him. Everyone despises him. J.K. Rowling, I feel like, shits on Hufflepuff a lot during the books, <laughs> but especially does it here because she says, quote, Hufflepuff, or Hufflepuff is upset because, quote, perhaps by the fact that Hufflepuff House rarely got any glory and that Cedric was one of the few who had ever given them any glory at all, having beaten Gryffindor once at Quidditch. 
So, so literally, like, the crowning moment in yeah. the house's history that has gone on for hundreds of years is that one year ago, Cedric beat Harry in Quidditch, and the only reason they won is because Dementors destroyed Harry Potter in the middle of a game where it was raining like crazy. Sure, and he fell off his broom. <laughs> like, their crowning achievement is that yeah. they beat another team in Quidditch once because their best player wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, at least I think that, like, I'm sure there are big achievements for Hufflepuffs over the years, but at uh-huh. least for that to be, like, the one in kind of, like, living recent memory to be the biggest okay. achievement, yeah. it just really shows, like, how, uh, yeah, like, how without glory they are, and you feel kind of bad for them. I feel so bad because they seem fine. Like, there's, I yeah. feel like of all the descriptions of Hufflepuff, like, my secondary house or whatever is Hufflepuff, because, like, they seem like they're just the house of, like, great friends, like, people that won't <laughs> flake out on you, people yeah. that will, like, plan trips in advance, they'll plan Skype calls with you when you're not like in school together like Hufflepuff seems like the best friends you have like my least favorite type of people are flaky people that don't follow through on stuff and Hufflepuffs wouldn't do that exactly they're the complete opposite like who doesn't want to have a Hufflepuff as a friend yeah I don't understand they get they get a hard lot (laughs) they really do they really do uh so Malfoy then also teases Harry classic Malfoy yeah and then Hagrid's class starts, and now the blast-ended scroots are huge. They're like it's three great. feet long. This is my favorite character arc for the entire book. It's the <laughs> I'm really scroots. intrigued. I hope they become important, but part of me also hope, hopes that like nothing happens. A couple chapters later, you get to the part where they're like six feet long. I would just yeah. love them to just not be revisited, and then like in the sixth book, someone's like, "Hey, Hagrid, whatever happened to the blast-ended scroots?" Like, I think that would be great. But I'm assuming they're going to be important since they talk about them all the time in this book. No comment. I ha- yeah, don't don't spoil it, but I have no idea what's going to happen. I really like the discussion of how you, you take it for a walk. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Like, like you- Hagrid has no idea what to do with these things. He's just no. guessing. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, they're three feet long, and apparently they've been killing each other due to pent-up anger, so yeah. he says the kids should walk them. So, <laughs> so, while... Naturally. Yeah, of course, naturally. Like, oh, this guy's really mad. What should we do? I just take him for a walk. So, so Hagrid then pretends to ask Harry for help with something, which is just a bro move of him being like, yo, how's it going? Because of the whole the whole thing with the Goblet of Fire, which is awesome. Like, I love that there's so many teachers at Hogwarts that are just complete bros and just like help Harry when they realize he's in a terrible just situation. Out for him. Yeah. Yeah. He goes to Harry and, and he right off the bat is like, somebody put your name in the goblet. And he and Harry's like, what? You think so? And he's like, oh, of course. And Dumbledore also thinks so too. Yeah. Ron may not believe him, but People that matter do, so that's fine. One thing I love about Hagrid is that he's got so many, um, he's got like all these like set principles and almost like yeah. altruisms in his life. So he's like, you know, Gringotts, safest place, set Pogwarts and, you know, Dumbledore, great <laughs> man. <laughs> like all of the, I think yeah. his way of thinking is kind of clear cut. Yeah, I feel like he would be a Hufflepuff because he's so loyal to his friends and Dumbledore and the school. Yeah, he's really loyal. And I I think it's great. It's very admirable. So the, the blast-ended scroots you learn are living up to their blast-ended name, and they <laughs> explode occasionally, and it sends the kids, like, flying through the air, That's quote, scary. several yards. Yeah. Like, you imagine you're walking this thing, and then you fly, like, 20 yards through the air. Like, that is ridiculous. So funny. Uh, I'm so sad that didn't make it into the film. Yeah, that was the also the note, like the next chapter that they talk about it. In my notes, I put in parentheses, there's no way the blast ended screws are in the movie. <laughs> like, no, no. They, they had so to get sad. to the screenwriting movie and the, or the screenwriting meeting and the person's like, okay, JK, so this whole blast ended screw thing, yeah. we're going to have to cut it. <laughs> Just for time. Just for time. Yeah. <laughs> and because how are we going to CGI whatever these things look like yeah i'm assuming they're hideous the class ends and then the narrator then reveals that the ravenclaws are also really mad at harry because yeah. they're offended that he broke the rules yeah <laughs> which is i think it's great they're just like mad at him on principle uh they're such nerds it's lovely they're like how dare you yeah how dare you affect the integrity of the goblet uh so Harry's not focusing in his classes at all. Yeah. Hedwig is still mad at him days later. Trelawney is apparently predicting his death, quote, more often than usual, <laughs> which is amazing. And uh, Cedric has girls swooning on him just as much as Victor Crumb. So that's just the whereabouts of Hogwarts at this state. And now Malfoy has made these little badges that say, support Cedric Diggory, the real Hogwarts champion. But then with like the flick of a switch... 
they can say Potter stinks. I mean, talk about petty. <laughs> it's just... Malfoy puts Hedwig to shame. <laughs> you couldn't have thought of anything better than Potter stinks. Like, he's easily the worst bully in the history of bullies. <laughs> I don't think anyone has ever been worse at insulting people. Well, he's never had to really try hard at being a bully. He's just had to, like, be blonde and wealthy. Yeah, I, uh, it's so dumb. Like, he could have come up with a pun. Like, he could have said, like, Harry Potter, like, the Goblet of Cryer or something like that. Like, I feel like yeah. there's so many, like, more clever, even lame jokes he could have made. But just Potter yeah. stinks is just, it just makes me upset. Really <laughs> does. And then Hermione agrees with me because she says, oh, yeah, really witty Malfoy. <laughs> like, yeah. just that it <laughs> like, says Potter good stinks. <laughs> good job. Yeah. You put a lot of creativity into this. Malfoy then immediately replies calling her a mudblood, as he does. He just always goes for the meanest thing right away. Yeah. Harry pulls out his wand. So does Malfoy, which is like the wizard version of like pointing a gun at someone's face. And then they do spells at each other, which hit each other in midair and yeah. deflect. And I had a question about this. So I was talking to someone about like how the movies are worse than the books. Mm -hmm. And something that someone complained to me is that in the movies, there's a lot of scenes where people will like do spells at each other and the two spells will like hit in midair and like make a ball or whatever like that. Yeah. And what my friend was telling me is that it doesn't happen a lot in the books. Yeah. But in the movie, they do it all the time. So is this like one of the few times it happens? Like yeah. is, is spells hitting each other not a thing? Um, it is. It's a thing that can happen, but it's a thing that shouldn't really happen it's like a spell gone wrong almost because you haven't been quick enough to perform it on other people okay you'll see in like later instances other examples of spells hitting each other but it's not something that widely happens and the films definitely make it seem like it happens all the time okay <laughs> um, but you yeah and you also kind of get more of a sense i think with this of of like ones in the books is of ones like reacting to each other because i know in chamber of secrets okay. when ron's um, wand is really faulty. Uh -huh. It just like deflects off other people and yeah, yeah. Know, lock heart and so on. So <laughs> you get more of a sense of like the actual skill involved in being a wizard. <laughs> in the books. Yeah. Whereas in the films, it's like, I'll point it. It's going to look great. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So the, the spells hit each other in midair. Yeah. Harry's spell deflects and hits Goyle, which gives him a bunch of boils on his face. Yeah. Boils for Goyle. Exactly. I loved the rhyming aspect. Malfoy's deflects and hits Hermione, which makes her teeth grow really large past her collar. Now, Hermione already has notoriously large teeth, and this is just, you know, kind of adding insult to injury. So Snape sends Goyle to the hospital wing immediately. Then Ron goes up to Snape and says, oh, look, Malfoy also hit Hermione. And he says, let me have a look at her, sees the teeth. And then Snape says, quote, I see no difference. Yeah, what? this is this is honestly, I have never forgiven Snape for this. A lot of people are Snape apologists. And this is like one of the few things that I hold up and I say no. Yeah. I don't care because you don't say to a kid, <laughs> you don't see any difference when her teeth are growing past her collarbone. That's yeah, just mean. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's mean. so it's so unnecessary. Like, I get that you don't like Harry. I get that you're jealous of Harry's dad because yeah. he hooked up with Mama Potter. Like, I get that you don't like Gryffindor. But, like, there's a student who is clearly suffering from <laughs> a spell that is doing something that shouldn't happen. And you're just being cruel. Yeah, you not even just, like, saying it's not a big deal, but, like, going out of your way to insult the fact that she has big teeth and you yeah. notice it. Like, oh, so dumb. I don't get it. Yeah, it, it's not just ignoring it it's humiliating her yeah at the same time and i think that's just like that's so it's so unforgivable to me that i just can't stand it yeah i really don't like it like i know snape is supposed to be a good guy but like after this i'm agreeing with you i really am not a big snape fan I really don't like this is just like over I get that he's like mad at people but this is like too much also how does he not get fired for this right? like how does Hermione not be like this teacher not only didn't help me but he insulted me to my face in front of the entire class like fire this man yeah it's it's <laughs> bad. <laughs> it's really bad. But thankfully, uh, Ron and Harry start calling him names. And like yeah. you've mentioned, it's one of the things where it is implied that they were cursing at him, but yeah. the book doesn't explicitly say it. So I don't know what they call him, but I love the idea of 14 year old kids just like being like, you're a fucking piece of shit, Snape, or something <laughs> just like, like yelling, that. Yelling, yelling, <laughs> just yeah. like being so bad. And they each get minus 50 and detention for this, which is like, you know what? Good. You stood up for Hermione. That's yeah. super awesome. 
they they get assigned that. Colin gets Harry out of potions class then, uh, because apparently the champions need to take pictures for the Daily Prophet. And Harry's like, Colin, why did you have to say this out loud? Like, why didn't, like, why did you have to say this thing that's going to make everyone hate me more? Like, you're the worst person. <laughs> but, like, he gets him out of being apparently poisoned. Poisoned, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thing, yeah. Like, in class, they're supposed to make poisons, and then Snape is like, I'm going to test yours, Harry. And Harry's like, well, great. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> so, so yeah, he does save him from that, but he does give him some extra yeah, embarrassment. Yeah, he, he, does, he does make it as worse physically possible (laughs) they're gonna take photographs yeah you find out that in addition to taking pictures that it is the wand wing ceremony which is the name of the chapter and they check that the wands don't have any defects so rita skeeter is there she's the worst and she's writing a piece on the tournament for the prophet so she grabs Harry and takes him into a broom closet. Inappropriate. Yeah, super inappropriate. Inter- interviews him using a quick quote quill, which like embellishes everything he says. Yeah. Like it doesn't just write down what he says. It like makes a bunch of statements that are not true. So I don't understand how they let her write with this thing. Dumbledore crashes this little interview. He busts the door open and is like, what's going on? We need Harry. Uh, she tries to brown nose Dumbledore and then he's like, oh, yeah, I loved the piece that you wrote about me. I really liked the part <laughs> yeah. when you called me an obsolete dingbat. It's so like, great. oh, And he so says good. it with such genuine humor as well. He's yeah. like, that was a great piece. Sassy Dumbledore, fantastic. So, so good. <laughs> so then she tries to, like, weasel her way out of it. And then he says, quote, I will be delighted to hear the reasoning behind the rudeness, but I'm afraid we'll have to discuss this matter later. Like, <laughs> oh, so Good. He's so good. fantastic. He's I really want a book of like just sassy Dumbledore and just like sassy Hermione. Right, like the way they do like Shakespearean insults. They do Dumbledore yes. and Hermione's insults. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. Also, Sassy McGonagall needs to be in there too. Oh, she, sassy she's McGonagall so in the previous book was peak McGonagall. I love her. So fantastic. Yeah, I love her. <laughs> she's she's amazing. At, at the studio tour in um in London, they ha- where they have the studio tour of the films, they have this amazing portrait of McGonagall, uh, oh. Maggie Smith as McGonagall, uh-huh. um, yes. and it's huge, and it has cats around her as well. That's it's amazing. Just, it's so great. I want it for my home. I gotta say, the Maggie Smith casting of McGonagall is perfection. It's so perfect. Absolute perfection. It's so amazing. No one else could do it like that. (laughs) No way. So the ceremony starts, and Ollivander is back, which I'm terrified of, because I think he is so (laughs) creepy, because he makes everything about Juan's sexual innuendos, and he does not need to be around children. (laughs) Um, <laughs> so so he, he confirms that Fleur is part Vila because in her wand, she has like one of her grandma's Vila hair. Yeah, which is creepy, but sure. Whatever you want to do, Fleur. So the hair is inside the wood of a wand. Like, how mm-hmm. do you get it in there? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like it's wood, right? I don't know how you just like stick a hair in the middle well, of it. I think, Unless they're I think hollow it's, on the inside like, or something. Yeah, I wonder whether they hollow them out or whether they do it if it's like ground into it in some way or, or they could like, i'm sure they could do a, ma- a magic spell to put it inside this is every right, anything too. Is i'm sure i'm sure magic <laughs> is involved on some yeah. level but yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh the whole this whole scene is just very phallic and it made me very uncomfortable because he then asks cedric do you treat your wand regularly Aye. and he's like oh yeah polished it last night and it's like Aye. oh yes. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> then Harry's like, oh, well, I haven't polished mine in ages. I'll polish it right now. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so bad. So uh, all the wands are in perfect condition. Thank God. Yeah. The group photo is taken and then all the champions leave. So Harry sees Ron in the Gryffindor Tower afterwards. And Ron tells Harry that he has a letter from Sirius. And he reminds him that detention is tomorrow. And Harry's like, oh, maybe Ron's being nice to me. But then Ron immediately leaves. So so not. Sirius then schedules the fireplace telephone conference, which I'm so excited about because I thought it happened in the third book. Because, oh, so I've seen the first four movies, but read zero of the books. So I know like some of the things. Um, So I knew that a fireplace conversation with Sirius took place. And I thought that it happened in Azkaban because I was like, this whole book is about Sirius. So when it didn't happen, I was really sad and then maybe worried it 
was just a movie thing. So yeah. when this when this happened, I got really excited because I think talking to people via, via fireplace is the it's coolest thing ever. It's so amazing. I love that part at the beginning of this book when the when they kind of introduce the concept of it. Yeah, um, so Ian good. Diggory eats eats toast in the fireplace. Yes. <laughs> in in the episode of this podcast where I talk about that, I flipped out about how cool that was. <laughs> like, it's pretty great. It's pretty that's great. The greatest thing ever. I wonder though, do they like should they have given him the bread not cooked so that I, the fire I, would I toast it? I've thought about that for so many <laughs> really? years. I don't know. Does the fire change the consistency of the food you eat? When does the fireplace end and the phone conference begin? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Uh, just begging the, the hard-hitting questions. It's, it's been bothering me for at least 10 years. Maybe longer. I feel like if people if people ever win some like sweepstakes to talk to J.K. Rowling, they'll ask her like intelligent so questions. Many questions. And, yeah, they'll ask her intelligent things like, "Oh, like what was the the meaning behind always?" Or like, "What was the the sentimental value of this?" And I'll be like, "Yo, so the fireplace thing. Yeah. <laughs> do they <laughs> toast the bread first, or yeah. do they just throw it? <laughs> and she'll hate me." And uh, I'll just be like, "When does the fire begin?" And and uh, the flu network. End. Ah, uh, so so many questions. Serious stuff. Oh man, it was just a little note that I added was that uh, in more instead of serious black because he's so crazy. Why don't they call him serious whack? All right, puns. Hey. So now we get to chapter nineteen. I just thought of it and I was like, this is going to be a great thing to add. And then immediately after, I was like, no, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so chapter nineteen, the Hungarian Horntail. Dragons. Dragons, indeed. So J.K. Rowling, not ironically, uses the word Fortnite to describe that. In two weeks, Harry's going to talk to Sirius, which I just think is great. It's like, Harry was really worried the whole next fortnight. I've never seen anyone use it. Is that a British thing? Yeah, we use it all the time. In America, the only time we use fortnight is like as a joke. Okay, so it's like actually a, a, a yeah. term of measurement in England. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. I just thought it was funny because in <laughs> America, it's, it's almost like a joke of like half of America probably doesn't know that a fortnight is two weeks. What? So you'll use it like, oh, and yeah, exactly. Like you'll be like, oh, in two fortnights time, I'll see you. And someone will be like, what? And they'd be like, a month. Yeah, they're like, we, we use it as much as we'd use like a month or a week or anything else. That's awesome. I wish we did it. Yeah. It's a fun word. Man. That's a good word. The UK is killing it. <laughs> so Harry is, is very nervous and he's convinced that yeah. he's going to die during the first task. He's like, I'm going to die 10 minutes in. This is my fate. Reasonable. Rita Skeeter's piece has been published and basically the whole thing just turns out to be about Harry. You find out that Crumb and Fleur's names are spelled wrong and only included in the last line and Cedric isn't in it at all, which makes me <laughs> yeah. ask two questions. First off, this is the most famous newspaper in the wizarding world and they don't have any editors that are like, hey, Rita... You spelled these two people's names wrong and you didn't talk about Cedric. <laughs> Aside from that, there's no like wizard spell check or like the quill doesn't like write well, things down properly. I just like don't understand how this mistake would happen in the most famous newspaper in the world. It makes me think that like Rita Skeeter has so much power and her space has so much power that no one would edit her because they know that yeah. she sells the paper and like she's popular. But it's true. true. Like there, there, there is that level of like, Throughout the books, there's that level of, well, magic makes all of these things possible, but then all of these things that we would see as normal and appropriate, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't include, like spell check. Yeah. Especially because spell check is called spell check, you know, come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that'd be so but good. But also, the other thing that's funny about that to me is that, like, Victor Crumb is a world famous Quidditch player. Yes. And he's in the last line. My, my bigger question was, how do you spell Victor Crumb wrong? <laughs> oh, like, I'm guessing with like a C instead of a, a C K. instead of a K, yeah. Yeah, or something like that, or like a B, like Victor Crumb, like a. Test oh crumb. yeah, C R U M B. <laughs> that would yeah, be great. So many options, so little time. <laughs> oh man, so good. There's also many things wildly incorrect in the piece yeah. about Harry. It says that he like cries every night and he's super sad. It says that Harry and Hermione are an item, which is yeah. far from the truth. And then later on, Harry is like trying to, you know, everyone's making fun of him for it. And he has an interaction with Cho Chang, which is great. But he, first off, didn't see it was Cho. And second, thought it was someone going to be making fun of him. <laughs> um, but she was just like giving his quill back, which he dropped. And he was like, oh, uh, sorry. And they have like an awkward moment where they clearly like each other, but then they leave. Then Harry sees Hermione. And rather than take the Harry approach, which is be upset about everything and like yell at people, Hermione just ignores everybody. And it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> like she's just like, nope, not going to, mm -mm, not going to give you any of my time. Which is always the best approach. 
Oh yeah, I think. so and then, so and, much and better. These kinds of situations, just ignore them. Yeah, if anyone's ever bullying you, they yeah. want to get a rise out of you. So just don't say anything or act yeah. like you don't care. And then you're fine. Yeah. So you learn that Harry and Ron's detention is pickling rats' brains in Snape's <laughs> dungeon, which seems interesting. There's no way that detention at the school is fair because it's just, if it's just doing chores for the teachers, yeah. doesn't that incentivize teachers to give detention? Oh, sure. But I'm like, also like, I never went to a boarding school, but it makes me wonder if boarding, boarding schools must be like this in some way, right? Maybe. Like, because I remember that detention, I never got detention at, um, primary school, but I do mm. remember someone saying that during detention they had to help the caretaker clean things and stuff. Uh, okay. See, I just had to sit in a room. I got detention once, and I had to sit in a room for 45 minutes, and you couldn't do anything. Yeah. You weren't allowed to work on homework or be on your phone or anything. You literally just had to, like, sit in a silent room for 45 minutes, which was oh God. pretty bad. Like, it was just dumb. That sounds like, terrible. I just, I was yeah. like, let me just, like, do homework or something. Like, it was just yeah. literally, detention was deleting 45 minutes from your day. Yeah. Which is fair, but uh, yeah. me getting the Painful. detention wasn't fair. I was just sitting next to someone that was talking, and they thought it was uh, me. I was so oh upset man. because the oh teacher man. was like, Mike, detention for talking or whatever. And I was like, I wasn't talking. And she's like, don't talk back to me. And then I was like, okay, oh, Miss LaFleur. Oh. <laughs> like, Those are the I'll kind just... of situations that are like uh, so frustrating was, when you're in school. It was so dumb. It was so dumb. So anyway, uh, I want those 45 minutes of my life back. Uh, So Hermione's trying to get Harry and Ron to make up. And they're just both being horrible. Like they're doing the whole like, well, you tell him that I said this. Like all the the worst thing ever. Harry is honestly getting a little bored of hanging with Hermione because they want to go to the (laughs) library all the time. And he doesn't like, he's like, man, Hermione is a good friend, but I hate going to the library so much. She's like, what Um, should we do for fun? Let's read theory about our homework. (laughs) Yeah. And she's like, oh, you're not good at charms? Well, maybe if you studied more, you'd be better at them. And he's like, no. Yeah. Uh. So you also learn that uh, that crumb is found in the library a lot, which Harry finds very suspect. And my initial prediction is that it's because he likes Emma Watson, uh, mm-hmm. which you find out to be true. Harry's like trying to think all of these things. He's like, maybe, maybe he's trying to study up or get better for the tournament or whatever. He just has a crush on Hermione. Yeah. But Hermione finds him annoying because there's always a group of girls that follow him into the library and they giggle as then she's just trying to study. They clearly don't have noise canceling headphones in the wizarding world. Yeah, not yet. So she insists that he isn't attractive and that they only like him because he's famous. And I just think it's great because I know from the movie that later she goes to the ball with him. I feel like in that scene, she's like being a little bit of a, doing a little bit of projection there. She's just trying mm-hmm. to like deflect her attraction to him. And, yeah, and totally. So um, I'm definitely projecting onto those girls who just, you know, they just got a little crush. <laughs> of course. So she says that they wouldn't like him if he couldn't do the, the wonky faint which is apparently okay. that that Quidditch Super. movie does. And then Harry's like, oh, it's called the Ronsky Faint, which is like, regardless, it's a stupid name. The idea of calling it the Wonky Faint is so great. And Quidditch is a horrible sport. Oh, I love Quidditch. <laughs> oh, you love it? Oh, then yeah, you shouldn't listen to Quidditch. any of the episodes of the podcast because I, <laughs> I average about one Quidditch rant per podcast. <laughs> Such a great sport. So much skill. And I just don't like it because it violates like the rules of a sport. Like it's good for the drama of it, but in yeah. terms of like, as someone who grew up, like I played a lot of sports growing up, yeah. I'm very passionate about like rules making sense and no rules in Quidditch make any sense at all. <laughs> it's what very What rules silly. in any sport make sense? Basketball makes perfect sense. I think basketball is yeah. a beautiful, perfect entity. Quid- I just don't like that Quidditch is a team sport where only one person matters. That's what it all really boils down to. <laughs> well, I don't like- but it, that's not the case though, because if you get more than... If you get points, 160 like, points, if oh, that's so yeah. many, I feel. Uh, but it did happen. Two crumb. It's happened. It has. Oh, man. <laughs> I hate Quidditch. <laughs> so uh, that's another reason why I liked, I've liked this book so far is like in yeah. the very beginning, they were like, no Quidditch for the year. And I was like, Wait, yes. Do you, do you know partly why that was? It was because J.K. Rowling hates writing Quidditch because she had to try and find interesting and weird things to happen while oh she was writing God. it. Yeah. I'm s- why did she why does she write about it so much if she hates it? Why did she invent a sport that she hates? <laughs> yeah, she she likes she likes Quidditch, but she just she's like I just don't know how to make each match interesting. Oh, uh, okay. You know? like, yeah, the, I mean yeah. the one thing I've learned is that J.K. Rowling clearly has like never played sports. 
<laughs> that's like what it all boils down to because she just like doesn't understand the concept of them. Uh, but that's great. I oh maybe if I did meet JK, we could bond about how awful Quidditch is, or at least I can oh, say, God. isn't it awful to write about Quidditch? And then she'll be right, like, oh right, right. yes, it's the worst. It's be on her page. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you learn that there's there's another Hogsmeade trip coming up, and Hermione's like, you yeah. know what, Harry, this would be a good way for you to like let off some steam. Harry's like, okay, and then Hermione's like, yeah, we can meet up with Ron at the Three Broomsticks, and then Harry's like, ah, oh, Ron's gonna be there. I'm only going if I can wear the invisibility cloak. <laughs> like so dumb. Oh my god. So gosh. dumb. Yeah. So they go to Three Broomsticks, and he basically makes Hermione look like a crazy person because he is in the invisibility cloak and talking to him. So she looks like she's talking to himself. She has to buy an extra butter beer for him and then like give it to him. So she just looks like a lunatic. And yeah. then she starts going on about uh, S P E W again, which is uh, I don't I find it to be a very annoying side plot. I feel like it's really very oh, oh I love maybe it. maybe maybe it'll be redeeming in the end. But right now it's yeah. just like I get that it's like anti-slavery, which is great, yeah, and very admirable. But literally all of the house elves love being slaves, and. Even Winky, the one who's free, wishes she could go back. Yeah. It seems like she's literally helping no one, but I'm assuming it will be good in the end. I think I think it's an interesting one to track because I think her approach to it changes over the years. Okay. I can I yeah. can see that. And is, and yeah. maybe it'll make Dobby a redeeming character. Because I know everyone loves Dobby, but I don't see why yet. Oh he my seems, god. He's I great. mean, I'm, I'm assuming he gets great later, but my only experience with him is like from book two where he was the worst. Yeah. And then this book where he's just like, he's not like mean. He's just like kind of annoying. And I just like <laughs> don't care about it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm assuming he gets, re- he gets awesome later because I know everyone really likes Dobby, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. Harry really, really wishes he wasn't in the tournament and just wants it all to go away. And he's really looking forward to talking with Sirius because he's feeling like Sirius will make him feel better about it. Moody and Hagrid then come over to Hermione and Moody can see through the invisibility cloak with his magical eye, which I think is pretty sweet. Hagrid whispers to Harry so that only Harry can hear uh, to come by his place at midnight that night. And when Harry tells Hermione that this happened, she's afraid that it would, you know, interfere with the phone call with Sirius that they have, because I, I don't know, they're doing it like 1 a.m. or 12.30 yeah. or something. So Harry decides that he's going to go, goes to Hagrid's. Hagrid then leads him to Madame Maxime's tent, which Harry's like, what is going on? Then they walk way far away from the castle, and you see a bunch of men dealing with four big old dragons, and Charlie Weasley is one of them. Charlie Weasley, easily the coolest Weasley. I know the book like tries to act like Bill is cooler, no, but Charlie, Charlie is so Charlie much cooler. Is- very cool. Bill works in a bank. Charlie wrangles dragons. I always think when I read that initial description of Bill, I'm like, Bill is someone, Bill is the kind of cool to someone who grew up in the punk era where punk yeah. was like the coolest thing you can be. Whereas Charlie yes. Weasley is like the kind of cool in our era. Yes. <laughs> Charlie, I feel like is like the hipster epitome of the wizarding world like he's just got Mm -hmm. this cool job and it's like really interesting he probably really loves coffee and stuff like he's one of those Mm -hmm. guys so (laughs) so he's talking to he's talking to Hagrid about the dragons he does an awesome Mrs. Weasley impression where he's saying that he like has to talk to his mom about Harry getting picked and he like says what she would have said I just love Charlie getting in on making fun of Mama Weasley think it's great Harry while wearing the invisibility cloak bumps into Karkarov (laughs) who starts freaking out and but then thinks he just like bumped into an animal that ran away so Karkarov clearly trying to cheat not good super sketchy Harry then leaves just in time to get to talk to Sirius at the fireplace and Harry notes that Sirius is looking good. He's like, oh, his face is fuller. He doesn't look as creepy anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and Sirius starts warning Harry about Karkarov. He's saying that uh, Dumbledore probably suspects something is up with him, which would explain the one-year Moody hiring. Like, that's why you need an aura on campus, because of Karkarov's past. And yeah. you also learn that Karkarov has been put into Azkaban by Moody. Yeah. <laughs> Seems highly problematic and that he got out of the jail because he made some sort of like plea deal with the Ministry of Magic to like get him amnesty or whatever. Yeah. Sirius suggests that he's probably the guy who put Harry's name in and that it's like this big old plot just to kill Harry and make it look like an accident. Yeah. I mean, Sirius sometimes could be so rash and so Mm -hmm. he and seeing things without complexity and seeing like, well... If someone's bad once, they must always be bad. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of interesting considering 
that he spent all this time in prison having been falsely accused of exactly. Something. He just <laughs> yeah. got very yeah he got very rigid ideas. He then discusses the Bertha Jockings disappearance. Uh, yeah. Which is great, because first he talks about, he's like, oh, it happened in Albania, that would make sense of meeting up with Voldemort there. And then Harry's like, but, you know, she wouldn't just, like, stumble upon Voldemort, right? And then he says, I went to school with Bertha. She is an idiot. <laughs> like, straight up. Like, so no. He <laughs> doesn't her. sugarcoat it at all. He's just, he's just like, Bertha's awful. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, so and that, that to me also, like, that felt like such a, like, infantilized version of Sirius. Yes. And it makes me want, like, they were really young when, like, Harry's parents were pretty young when his parents died. Um, Mm -hmm. Sirius was pretty young when he was falsely accused of murder. And it just makes you think, like, was that 12 years of just not maturing at all? And just maybe, (laughs) like... Benjamin buttoning back into your like, high school <laughs> yeah, self. Yeah, his maturity was just put on pause when he was in jail. Yeah. And now he's like a grown man, but he still acts like a teenager. <laughs> so oh, Harry so. then hears footsteps, so he tells Sirius to go away. Turns out to yeah. be Ron, who was actually being really nice and was just wondering yeah. where Harry was. This is where I really don't like how Harry handled this. So Harry's being super sassy. He yells at Ron for snooping about. Yeah. And then the narrator says, quote, at that moment, Harry hated everything about Ron, even down to the bit of ankle showing from yeah. the bottom of his pajamas. It's like, yo, sorry that Ron doesn't have enough money to like buy new pajamas every year because he's a growing boy and is like naturally growing. Uh, but like you're th- it seriously irks you that his pajamas don't fit. Like, who are you, Harry? Like that is yeah, so it's dumb. Like a, it's that kind of like childlike <laughs> irrational hatred you suddenly get with someone. And you're like, I'm not inviting you to my party anymore it's like that kind of charged anger and it's so mean (laughs) it's so terrible so then they argue back and forth ron says uh why don't you go back practicing for your next interview uh which i think is a great insult and then harry throws one of the potter stinks badges at ron hits him in the face and then says Mm -hmm. that he should wear it tomorrow and hopefully you'll get a scar that's what you've always wanted right like Whoa, <laughs> fuck off, Harry. Like, yeah. holy shit. Like, give it a rest. I but get that you're Harry Potter. This, like, this all comes from Ron interrupting his conversation with Sirius. Like, that was yes. enough. That was enough of it yeah. to just, yeah, I don't know. Like, funny. I understand Harry because he was, he notes that he's like, when he first starts talking to Sirius, it makes him feel really good. And then he's talking a lot and it like puts him at ease. And he's yeah. upset that Ron, like, ruined this. But right. Ron is, like, checking in to make sure you're okay. Despite being really mad at you. Ron has taken time out of his day to find you at one in the morning and make yeah. sure you're not facing any danger. You can't be nice about that at all. So uh, I just no, really yeah, no. didn't <laughs> like how handle Harry handled that situation. And then basically they just yell at each other a little bit more. They both go off to bed super angry. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of the chapter. And funny enough, that's going to be the end of this episode. <laughs> um, so we'll just end it on this super annoying, grunty uh, Harry versus Ron thing. And we'll pick it up next time. Great. But we'll have you back for the next episode as well. So Yay. this will be great. But thank you so much for joining in on this episode. Oh, Rosanna. my pleasure. This was super fun. I'm glad to have the, the, the first, you're the first non-American, the first well, British that's very, person. That's a, that's a very big honor. I know. It's, I think, I think you should put it on your resume, honestly, because will, in a couple months when this gets posted, obviously this will be the most world renowned podcast in the world. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for being on. Um, do, are there any social medias that you want to plug? I know you have a lot of yeah, stuff oh, going on. And they all have different usernames as well, which is super annoying. Mm. Um, on Twitter, <laughs> I'm at Paper Time Lady. Um, on mm-hmm. YouTube, I'm at youtube.com slash Rosianna. That's R-O-S-I-A-N-N-A. Nice. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining. And everyone listening, thank you so much for listening along. You can follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. We're on Twitter at Potterless Pod. If you rate us or talk nice about us on any platform or just to your mom will highly appreciate that uh and until next time as they say in the wizarding world wizard on <laughs> Potterless was created by Mike Schubert it is hosted by Mike Schubert it is edited by Mike Schubert it is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Leon Davis Griffin Meckleberg Vicky Garcia Andres Ozelby and Aaron Johnson and the music is by Bettina Campomanes thank you guys so much for listening you can find us on any of your preferred podcasting apps at twitter.com slash potterlesspod at facebook.com slash potterless and patreon.com slash potterless where you can pledge money in exchange for bonus content and all of those funds help make the podcast better but anyway guys thank you so much and until next time wizard on